Coming up today, in a move that will strain bilateral ties even further, Japan's culture ministry reignites dubious claims Japan ruled part of Korea many centuries ago. The claims will also appear in recently approved history textbooks. North Korean state media confirms the country's top political official, Hwang byung so is second in command behind leader Kim Jong-un. Plus, a jury in the US finds Joker Zanayev guilty of killing three people and injuring 264 in the Boston Marathon bombing. He could face the death penalty. These stories are more coming right up. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Thursday, April 9th here in Seoul. Thanks ever so much for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We start with Japan's latest attempts to distort history. And this example stretches back centuries to ancient times. A Korea-based media outlet is reporting that Tokyo is strengthening its historical claims that it ruled over Korean territory around the time of the Gaia Confederacy. The theory of Imna, or Mi mana in Japanese comes from Japanese scholars who claim that Japan established a military outpost in Gaia during Korea's ancient Three Kingdom period and ruled over the territory from the end of the 4th to the 6th century. Now, this Imna theory, which remains a disputed issue, is presented as a widely accepted theory in most middle school history textbooks, these that were recently approved by the Japanese government as well as on its Culture Ministries website. A private research institute in Korea says it has evidence that the Japanese military forced Korean women into sexual slavery before and during World War II. Ojinju reports. The Japanese government says there is no evidence that Japan had forcibly recruited women for wartime sex slaves. But now, a Japanese document recently found by the Busan-based Korea-Japan Culture Research Institute is countering this claim. The document is a certificate issued in 1940 by Yoshihide Hayashi, who was at that time commander of the Taiwan Army Research Section. The certificate was intended for a director in charge of what they called comfort women stations. It says the director will be taking comfort women by force to Japan's army units in China and adds that these women are essential to the troops, so make sure that there is no difficulty for the director in making the crossing. Kim Mun Gil, head of the research institute that found the document, points out its significance. It is a document showing that the Japanese army ordered the recruitment of the sex slaves. This is the first document that actually used the word that means forcibly took away. On the document, the name and address of the director in charge of the brothels were erased. According to Kim, the absence hints that Tokyo is trying to deny its wartime atrocities when there's clear evidence. All the names of the comfort women are also erased in the documents with black markers. It just shows that the Japanese government is trying to hide its past wrongdoings. The institute found the document in a compilation of Japanese records published in 1997 by the Asian Women's Fund. The fund was set up by the Japanese government in the early 1990s to compensate victims of the country's military sexual enslavement before and during World War II. Oh jin Editing News. Now, the full leader of Korea's ruling Senuri Party has called for the National Assembly to cooperate in the handling of pressing issues, namely the recovery of the sunken Seolho ferry and the government's push to reform the pension system for public sector employees. Choi Sun reports. In his first address to the National Assembly since being elected the ruling party's floor leader, Yu Seung Min said the government should keep its promise to find every missing body from the Seolho ferry, which sank off Korea's southwestern coast almost a year ago. I'm calling for the swift conclusion of a technical review on the salvage and recovery of the Seolho ferry. 
Nine of the more than 300 passengers who died in the accident remain unaccounted for. The families of the victims have demanded the vessel be recovered immediately. President Bakunhe said earlier this week the government will pursue the issue after the civilian-led technical review. The ruling party floor leader also urged the opposition party to participate in reforming Korea's costly public employee pension system. The two parties had previously agreed to reach a compromise on the matter by the end of this month's parliamentary session. If the opposition party wants to call itself an economic party, it must push for the passage of public employee pension reforms during the April session. The outspoken lawmaker also criticized the Park administration's welfare without taxes policy, saying it's time for the rival political parties to set their differences aside and talk about achieving a balance between welfare and taxes. As for the question of stationing the controversial THAAD U.S. missile defense system in South Korea, you stressed that Seoul needs to display a strong deterrent against North Korea's security threats to bring about peace in the region. In a rare move, the main opposition party welcomed Yu's message, taking special note of his criticisms of the government's economic policies. Opposition party leader Moon Jae-in will address the assembly on Thursday. Choi yoo Sun, Arirang News. Now, North Korea's top political official, Hwang Byung-so, has solidified his position as the second most powerful man in the reclusive nation. Pyongyang state-run Korean Central Television said on Wednesday that Huang was a member of the political bureau under the Central Committee of the Workers' Party in addition to his current post as top political officer in North Korea's military. Now, this confirms speculation that Huang has become the de facto second-in-command to Kim Jong-un in the communist regime, the position previously occupied by Choi ryong hae Analysts say that Huang's promotion might have been decided back in February when Kim presided over a meeting to deal with personnel reshuffling. And North Korea has poured cold water on optimism that a recently agreed nuclear deal between world powers and Iran could encourage Pyongyang to follow a similar path. An official from North Korea's mission to the United Nations told Voice of America that last week's agreement on curbing Tehran's Nuclear program may be good for Iran, but it has no effect on his country's nuclear ambitions. The official said Pyongyang cannot give up its nuclear arms when American aircraft carriers with tactical nuclear weapons are hovering around the Korean peninsula. The official was referring to the ongoing military exercises between South Korea and the US, which the two countries say are purely defensive in nature. Now, if the Iran nuclear deal goes through, economic sanctions imposed on the country could be eased or even completely lifted. The move would create massive business opportunities for Korean companies. Shin Semin reports. Korean firms doing business in Iran may be back on track soon. The companies, mostly construction firms, are gearing up for a wide range of business opportunities there as Iran is in the midst of boosting its infrastructure. Iran was the fourth largest construction market for Korean builders before international sanctions were imposed in 2006 and the orders from Tehran stopped in 2009. Korean construction firms have established a good reputation, as many of them even stuck around during the Iraq war. With the sanctions to be lifted, the Iranian market will open up, giving more orders to companies like Talim International, GSENC and Hyundai ENC, Korea's leading builders. The easing of sanctions on Iran is expected to open up other doors for Korea as well. Korean exporters of auto parts and steel are also hoping to reap the benefits of the nuke deal. In addition, this opens the way of new influx of goods and services from Iran to Korea. Without the sanctions on Iran, Korean companies will at least be able to recapture their market share, which was lost due to the sanctions. And Iran will also be buying Korean-made goods like home appliances and IT products. And there's another big benefit for Koreans at home and abroad. 
Under the deal, Iran will be allowed to increase its oil exports by up to a million barrels per day. And experts say that could bring down the global oil prices by as early as next year, resulting in cheaper oil for both Korean companies in Iran and Korean drivers here at home. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is widening in Korea. And while most people struggle to make ends meet and are cutting back on the basics, Korea's richest 10% are spending more on designer brands and luxury goods. Gwon Soa reports. The polarization of spending habits in Korea is getting worse as the nation's low- and mid-income earners struggle to get by while the rich continue to enjoy the good times despite the sluggish economy. Data released by the retail industry on Wednesday shows first quarter sales at large retailers, popular among consumers who tend to watch their pennies, mostly declined compared to one year ago. Lotte Mart, the second biggest retailer in the country, posted a 3% drop in sales, and Home Plus an almost 1% dip, while Emart, the nation's number one retailer, saw sales edge up a mere 0.8%. Breaking it down, Emart's fashion and grain sales in March both plunged by over 10% on year. Fisheries and processed food fell by 9 and 3%, respectively. The big supermarkets have tried to boost sales by reducing the price of everyday products such as milk, but the figures speak for themselves as sales managers say the strategies weren't that effective. On the other hand, sales of more expensive products like imported spices and vegetables weren't that affected. That trend is even clearer when we look at sales at two of Korea's high-end department stores, Lotte and Hyundai. They recorded gains of between 8 and 15 percent in their luxury designer label sales. This reflects a recent study which shows Korea's richest 10 percent own nearly half of the nation's wealth. Department stores and distributors these days are focusing more of their efforts on marketing strategies targeting VVIPs as their consumption takes up a considerable amount of sales. Some examples of this include special campaigns for products like expensive desserts and premium coffee, and that's raising concerns that spending trends will become even more polarized. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. The man accused of the Boston Marathon bombing that killed three people and injured more than 250 others has been found guilty on all 30 counts against him. 21-year-old Joker Zanayev must now wait for the jury to decide whether or not he will face execution as more than half of the charges carry the death sentence. The sentencing part of his trial is expected to start next week. The verdict comes nearly two years after the attack when two bombs Zanayev and his brother Tamalan planted exploded, as you can see there near the finish line of the race. Faced with the unravelling situation in Yemen, the United States says it's speeding up weapons deliveries and adding to intelligence and logistical aid to the Saudi-led military campaign against Houthi rebels in the small Arab state. Speaking in the Saudi capital Riyadh on Wednesday, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken said the U.S. was joining Saudi Arabia in sending a strong message to the Houthis and their allies that they cannot overrun Yemen by force. Now, speaking to reporters in Tokyo on Wednesday, U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter said that al-Qaeda's branch in Yemen has been taking advantage of the fighting between Houthi rebels and pro-government forces to seize territory in that country. The United Nations says over 100,000 people have been displaced since Saudi airstrikes began last month. Back here in Korea, and more than 2,000 people from around 40 countries are taking part in Asia's largest health and medical event, the Bio and Medical Korea Week, which is being held in Seoul and will run through Friday. Our Kim Jeon reports. The Bio and Medical Korea event showcases the immense development of the country's medical and healthcare services, making it a destination for medical tourists around the world. 
Korea welcomed more than one million foreign patients for the first time earlier this year. During the event, the health ministry signed agreements worth 605 million U.S. dollars to facilitate exports of its medical products and services. Those deals are in line with the government's emphasis on the medical industry as a key growth sector. One of the highlights of the event is the 10th anniversary celebration of the International Vaccine Institute, a nonprofit organization in Korea working for the development and proliferation of new and improved vaccines. In collaboration with LG Electronics, one of Korea's leading tech conglomerates, the institute recently conducted a cholera vaccination campaign in Ethiopia. The cholera vaccine helps to prevent the spread of diseases incurred by consumption of unsanitary or contaminated food and water. President Bakane sent a video recorded message offering her congratulations on the opening of the event and vowing to provide more government support for the development of the bio and medical technology. She expects the investment will contribute to improving the quality of life worldwide as well as create more jobs. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Well, that's all the news we have for now. I'm Mark Broom. Have a wonderful day, and thanks, as always, for watching. Goodbye.